It was uh, so amazing. It's such a beautiful, intense experience. Um, and it's so primal to everyone. It's elemental, it's part of life. Um, and it's also an amazing opportunity to feel courage, to feel the fear and then go, you know what, I'm gonna do it anyway. So even on the way here, and I've filmed so many things and I've been done TV work, etc., etc., and I still get a little bit of a ch of um, I have to perform, I have to be here, I have to be present, I have to speak my speak. Um, and that fear gives you an edge. It gives you a little bit of a push into um, creativity. However, if it's too much and you get into what's called distress rather, uh, rather than new stress, or sort of non-beneficial stress, um, when your system gets hijacked, you're in cortisol, you're releasing basically poison, cortisol kills uh, various cells and you know, it inflames your body, um, you, lo you lose all capacity to, to be present. Um, you're just caught up in your patterns and not there. I think fear is a fabulous messenger. I think fear is always trying to tell you something. And most of us try and bottle fear or close it down or shut it off because it's unpleasant. And yet, if you just take a moment and you, and you tune into that fear and you say, what is it that you're trying to tell me? Now, usually it's a complete nonsense. It could be that the fear is trying to tell you that you're not good enough. Um, but actually, sometimes the fear is actually trying to say you're ill-prepared for this and you do need to go and get some research done. You do need to go and, um, and, and perhaps do a couple of things rather than blindly running into something. So for me, fear is a messenger. It also has an energy to it. And then I get the chance to, to do what I call is pull the master switch. And that's that back to that connection again and I know that when I feel connected uh, when I feel loved by the universe by everything by myself by this chair um, nothing really can affect me too much and the fear literally drains out I can actually feel it melting and it's literally I actually believe and neurologically it is melting because the oxytocin um, is opening up all your synapses and opening up your nerves, nervous system um, rather than the sympathetic nervous system which is stress pulls it down pulls the muscles in and there's no room there's no space so yeah becoming aware taking a breath um, and then becoming curious to see what is it, what's, what can I transform in this moment. So before I go on stage as a public speaker or before I see a client or before I do anything that has importance, I'm going to get scared because it matters. And by getting scared and knowing it matters, fear is an energy. And I take the energy of fear and I actually use it as, as, a, as a progressive tool that when I go on stage or, and do, do the uh, public speaking or when I'm with the client, I use the energy of fear to actually add a sparkle and something tangible to whatever it is that I'm doing. So first of all, check in, make sure that fear is a messenger, make sure it hasn't actually got a point. Um, and then once you're sure that it hasn't got a point, use it as an energetic force to actually bring greater creativity to everything that you're doing. I always like to think about people as being five-year-old children with a big sack on their back. And it's kind of like you don't know what's in that sack. You'll never know what's in that sack but you can help to lift the burden. Power is very interesting, and particularly in business, um, because you've not only got status in business, so you've got the managerial corporate status, you've got the entrepreneurial status, which is very much more feisty and fiery, um, and then you've got you know, who dares wins, and who can be the mo most confident, let's say, in the boardroom or amongst other people. And I think part of it is to create a structure that enables you to be powerful so that you don't have to fight your corner all the time. Make it clear within the structure. Um, also to stick by it and not be afraid of that. Um, I think there's so many different areas. So there's power amongst women, number one. Let's not hide that one you know sort of ben johnson wrote women beware women and i think that still holds true today because i think women instead of supporting each other they are afraid of each other they want to be the only woman i think it's quite natural instinct the only woman amongst alpha males we've got to change that um, and i don't think that comes from the top i think that comes from other women i think amongst men you know they either see you as a sexual object or somebody that is challenging them. And I remember hearing a woman saying, you've got to use the male tactic, which is not equal, but you've got to you know, destroy them, or you've got to be under them or over them. You know? And so that 
is something to play with in your head because you can only do what you do in your business circumstances. Um, what is weird, I, I was, I've always been an outsider. So my family were Scottish working class. I grew up in North London. At the time that was mainly Irish Catholic and I went to a predominantly black school. So I've always been a bit of an outsider. And what I kind of consoled myself or what gave me strength was this idea, if you're Scottish, you grew up with a lot of Scottish history. So I grew up with lots of Scottish history. So I was very proud of the fact that I was Scottish, even though no one thinks I am, apart from my parents and me. And so if I needed any, any courage, I used to think of Wallace or Bruce. It sounds a bit ridiculous, but that would keep me going, the fact that, the fact that I was Scottish and no one else was. And um, it is weird, that kind of belief but it, it did work because you kind of think you know there's a very famous story of Bruce in the cave and the spider which we won't go into but it's that that Scottish idea if you just carry on regardless whatever the odds and that used to keep me going. Do you know it's interesting my some of my limiting beliefs were that I didn't actually think I had any and um, <laughs> what I mean by that is it's like I, I grew up trying to do my best you know really being the, the the kid that tried really hard you know it, it turned out I was quite good at running so I so I tried really really hard to be the, the best runner I could be and and almost anything else I did I, I really wanted it I didn't realize that my dreams were so small until I started meeting other people until I started you know traveling a little bit with with athletics and then you know later in my in my career I, I didn't have limiting beliefs as I thought it I just didn't dream particularly big and you know what I've learned and what I've come to appreciate really working with with clients all over the world and, and you know thousands and thousands of them now is that you know our lives are a product of the scope of our thinking and of course what we try and do is we try and sort of micromanage ourselves in our heads within that sort of confines of what we think is possible and and to me that's a little bit like looking at the big picture through a letterbox you know, we can only ever see what we're, what we're looking for and, and where the blinkers are. And so for me, the, the, the biggest thing was, you know, to take those blinkers off and realize that it doesn't matter what we think, it's not necessarily true. And of course, as soon as we do that and open up to all the other possibilities of different things that might be there, we find that there's a world and a life and opportunities that not only did we not think were possible, we didn't even know were there. If you're a creative, if you've started your own business or whatever you do, it's yours. We're all creative. It's how do you tap into that and what do you do with it and not be afraid of that element, even though other people are attacking you because other people do attack you. They will attack you if, you, if they're a bit jealous. Um, businesses attack you because they want to be like you or take what you've got. There's a very predatory attitude, I think, when you're successful. And I think that's why celebrities find it difficult. You know, a lot of comedians find it difficult. It's, it's a wor the world is worse in that respect, but it's gathering together with people that can support you. And I think that's people around you that know where you're going. And also, if you have a secondary agenda, which is actually, this is my soul's purpose, which I know is a bit trite to say, <laughs> because everybody goes, well, what is that? But if you believe that you can help do something in this world, or you've got a purpose here yourself on a spiritual level, it really helps you overcome those elements that are really dark and difficult in our lives, because those are the times that you just think, right, I'm gonna give up. But then where do you go without that inspiration from something deeper? I think a limiting belief that I think a lot of people from working class backgrounds have is that, you know, I, I see that when I went to uni and you, had, you saw middle class people, particularly those who went to public school, a lot of them have a sense of self-entitlement. So they assume that doors will be open to them and they assume people will be yes. So it makes their way through life a lot easier, I think. And I think if you're working class, you tend to have a slight chip on your shoulder. So you don't assume those doors are going to open. So you're kind of going, oh, if you don't mind, if you could come in. And so I think that can hold you back. And I think that's quite a hard thing to to get over because you, I don't know why, but you tend to grow up with that, I think. And I see that a lot. You see that particularly on stand-up where certain people have certain, have certain confidence and a certain sense of entitlement, which I kind of envy. I find it annoying, but I also quite, quite envy it because I don't have that. There's, um, I think, two key things. Um, one is definitely my self-belief, so really connecting with my authentic self, um, my values, who I am, my natural strengths, because 
those are really the things that um, help me move forward um, through challenges, through setbacks um, and really reach goals. Um, so I always, if I'm basically afraid of something or just, yeah, a challenge that's come up, I just remember really who I am, what am I doing here? Why is it that this is important to me? Um, and I really just, just basically work through it um, through, through a process. And the second thing that really gives me courage is, is the people around me. So I, I call it basically my tribe. So the people that kind of give me strength and courage and they give me passion. Um, so they basically support me, they encourage me and I do the same for them. And kind of together we help each other um, through challenges. And I think that's, that's so important in, well, in life in general is, is these social networks that you have. And yeah, it reminds me of a little story. There's a, there's a, a chapter in, uh, in Just Get On With It. It's called Are You A Duck? on the M6, M6 is a motorway, uh, and it goes right the way, the, the, almost the full length of the, the UK. And I pulled in one night, and, and it was late, and I was nursing a cup of coffee, and, and you know, a blueberry muffin, and there's these ducks, quite unusual for a service area, but there's these ducks in a, a, in a pond, in a sort of concrete pond by the car park. And they would sort of swim across, take out a bit of sandwich, and then swim back, and if they didn't like the sandwich, they'd wait for the next bus party to come in, hopefully they'd but better sandwiches and they and I thought, God, those ducks have got it easy. You know, they what a life those ducks have got. They just paddle across, get their lunch, paddle back. And then I realized where we were. And we're in the Lake District. Now the Lake District is one of the most beautiful places I think on earth. And Lake Windermere is on the other side of the hill. Can't be any more than three or four miles as the duck flies. But those ducks weren't flying. Those ducks were quite happy to just sit there in the concrete pond with the diesel fumes pecking on what was thrown to them. Now I assume they didn't even know that Duck Nirvana was just over the hill. So it wasn't necessarily that they had limiting beliefs. They didn't even know it was there. And so my advice is, the world is not what you think it is. Go out and find what it really is. Mm -hmm.